Quite often, uh, there are a lot of things that can cause conflict in a church, but not everything. Not everything causes conflict. We've you never, it doesn't matter what church you're in, ever hear people arguing over who gets to sit in the front row. Mm -hmm. Apparently, we're not even having trouble getting people to sit in that whole section over there. Were, as we were singing people over there. Never find too much conflict over deciding who gets to uh, the honor of volunteering to do cleaning. And do you ever find a lot of conflict if the sermon lets out a little bit early? Not that that happens very often. We're coming to the end of a series that we've called Conflict. And this is the last week we're going to be on this particular series. It's been an interesting experience. And as we've gone through, we've certainly seen some testing. And I know some in our congregation have been tested in the area of conflict through the last few weeks and months. There has been a lot of questions. It's been a sermon series in which many people have come to me and asked me questions. And we've gone on this very intriguing journey. I'm going to tell you, conflict will happen. And why will conflict happen? It's because we live with other people. It is inevitable. And none do it perfectly. All struggle. Some do it better than others. Some handle conflict better than others. But it's a part of life. And as people who follow Jesus Christ, we have one goal when it comes to conflict. And it's the same goal that we have for all things in the Christian life. And that is to bring glory to God. To bring glory to God. Conflict. Our goal is to bring glory to God. And because that is true, Conflict it can lead us to great growth. Now, it can go a whole other way. I mean, conflict can leave us embittered when we let forgiveness, unforgiveness, fester in our hearts. It can completely cut us off from God. Or we can do it the way that God intended and allows the Holy Spirit to break down walls that keep us prisoners. So we're going to come to one last message today. One last message. See, the last three weeks, we've been talking about how do we handle it if we need to confront and bring conflict out with somebody. What do we do in those cases? Uh, we've seen a biblical plan. We've had some very practical thoughts. And last week we came to a really, really key sermon on forgiveness. And if you missed it, I encourage you to look it up on our website, uh, follow the links to the YouTube video. Because really, forgiveness is the hinge of the entire topic of conflict from a Christian point of view. Because Christianity is all about forgiveness. We have been forgiven. And because we have been forgiven, we are to be people who bring forgiveness. And I'm going to tell you it's a complicated topic. And there is no topic in this whole conflict series that right from day one when I started that I've got more questions about than this whole question of forgiveness. Particularly, how do I handle forgiveness when or if, when it's hard, or when there's troubles, or when they don't want to be forgiven? It's a complicated question. And we're going to deal a little bit more with being Forgiven as we go through this sermon today. We've dealt the last three weeks with people who are driving us crazy 
or people who we see in sin, or people we have problems with. And today, I want to turn it around. What happens if somebody has a problem with us, if somebody sees sin in our lives, if somebody is being driven crazy by something we've done? And they come to us because they have a trouble with us. What is a Christian reaction? We read a bunch of books as we've gone through this sermon series. And I originally was going to steal a, a list out of one of the books that talks about, so how do you handle it? If somebody comes to you and they attack you unfairly, or in a way that is inappropriate, or they break all the rules we looked at the last three weeks, they do everything wrong. And as I was reading this and mulling it over, it struck me that, you know, this list isn't just about when people attack us unfairly. You see, people can come to us and say, I have a problem. Or I see something wrong in your life, and you know what? They may just be right. They may see something that is, they're correct to correct us. It may be very legitimate for them to come and say, I have a problem with something here. Because even when it's legitimate, what is our natural reaction? It is to become defensive. And if we become defensive, we're never going to get anywhere. We should never, ever expect perfection from ourselves. Although we may want the world to see us as perfect or close to it. We grow when we're admonished. And the question we have to ask is, what is more important to us sometimes? Our dignity or growing spiritually? Our dignity or growing spiritually? We can't always have both. The Bible talks about iron sharpening iron, meaning that sometimes conflict is going to force us to grow. I want to give us five rules for how Christians should react. It's our last real list of this series. First is we need to control our tongue. First Peter chapter 3 says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Answer an evil with a blessing. If somebody comes to you and they say something that upsets us, we shouldn't go on the offensive. And by the way, by controlling our tongue, it, it does mean when they're standing in front of us and they're saying something and we want to retaliate back. But it also means control our tongue when they're not standing in front of us and we're with a whole group of people. <sighs> and we want to get gossipy. Or perhaps, to pouring it into the year 2016, when we're not with anybody except our computer or our tablet and we're on Facebook or some other form of social media. Because boy, it's hard to control our tongue sometimes there. In that very 2016, we are to control our tongues. Secondly, Seek godly advice. Book of Proverbs 27, verse 5 and 6. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. In other words, it's better off to have somebody come after us publicly than, than them just to pretend everything's good. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Carefully. In confidence, go to somebody you trust and say, here's what I'm hearing about myself. What do you see? What do you see? 
That's a hard thing to do. I have periodically over the years had somebody come to me and say, you know, I'm, somebody has a problem with me. What do you think? And not nearly often enough in my life, but occasionally I have been the one to go to somebody and say, you know, somebody has a problem with me. What do you think? I wish I could say I do it all the time. It's happened, but not nearly enough. We should seek godly advice. Thirdly, keep doing what's right. 1 Peter chapter 2. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Do not let them change you. Do not let them change your ethics. We've talked about this several times. That at what point can you be so offended, so hurt, that it's okay to disobey the rules of God? And I've said, think about it before you answer, right? This is the same idea. Just because you're upset with somebody doesn't mean you get to disobey. You get to do things in a worldly way. You get to go on the attack. You get to say nasty things. It's not how it works. Not how it works. <coughs> Fourthly, this might have more to do with times in which somebody's saying things that are unfair or in a poor way. But Romans chapter 12 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We need to recognize our limits to control a situation. That's the fourth point. Recognize our limits to control our situation. Do you know what? There are going to be people who, even if we say, I'm sorry, are still going to be mad at us. There are people who are going to come after us for things that are illegitimate. That's called life. Guess what? You can't help it. You can't control them. Recognize that all you can control is me. And finally, fifthly, use the ultimate weapon. A couple verses after this, Romans 12, 20. In the verses in between, it says, Do not take revenge, but leave room for God. And then it says, On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Use the ultimate weapon, which is love. This isn't only true if somebody's attacking us unfairly. God calls on us to be people of love. Treat people better than they treat you. Which leads us to the great exam of all of this. How well do we handle conflict? Maybe the greatest, truest test is this. How do I handle it when someone is upset with me? I've asked this question before. Do you want to be right? Or do you want to be reconciled? That's the true test of all of this. Do you want to be right? Do you need to be right? Or do you want to be reconciled with somebody? Most of the time, we do not get an option for both. There is a story in the Gospel of John of the Pharisees seizing a woman that they caught in adultery, dragging her off, throwing her in front of Jesus, and saying, well, we're supposed to stone her. What do you think? Jesus doesn't get around to an answer right away, but when he eventually does, he looks at them and says... He who is without, first, without sin casts the first stone. He bends down. He's right in the dust. I don't know what exactly he's doing. But he looks up and it's him and the woman alone because everybody else has left. 
Sometimes we miss what's perhaps the most important message of this story, and that is this is a confrontation, not between the Pharisees and the woman, not between Jesus and the woman, it's a confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees. In fact, this story plays a large role in leading to what we're going to remember on Friday. Because Jesus confronts the hypocrisy in the Pharisees, and they leave seething in anger, feeling that they have been completely humiliated. They fail mightily. Why? Because in the end, they did not see themselves as sinners. At least, this is really critical, at least not in comparison to this woman who was a real sinner. They're not really bad, she is. Because that is true, they, in their minds, did not need a savior. Satan looks for places to exploit, for openings that he can get in and just work his way in and, and play with our minds. We are told that our fight is not with flesh and blood, but with powers and authorities and principalities, and by that it means our battle is not with the things around us, with other people. Our battle is with a demonic enemy. You know, there's some really interesting thoughts with that, with that when it comes to conflict. Then. Because when we fight back with the words that come out of our mouth, with our actions, with other natural human reactions, Rather than with spiritual weapons of love and prayer, we will fail. Which is why proving ourselves right in the end will never succeed in the end. Because it's concerned about appearances, how I look in other people's eyes, with my own concept of myself. In other words, I'm fighting with pride. Can we defeat the devil with our own pride? Never. Never. Sometimes we need to discover that I do not have everything figured out, that my understanding of things is insufficient. We need to approach conflict spiritually rather than my own understanding. A couple of weeks ago, I'm in the middle of this sermon series and I'm clicking on my emails and there was an email from Focus on the Family advertising a book that they were starting to sell and I looked at it and thought, oh my. It's called Fight Your Way to a Better Marriage. How healthy conflict can take you to deeper levels of intimacy. I'm thinking, boy, that sounds like my sermon series. So I bought the book. Now I didn't get enough time to do much with it with this sermon series, but I started reading. It's gonna go in the church library, so I'm gonna actually leave it out here this week. I've got a couple of copies. And this sounds like of interest to you. You might want to grab it. I, uh, this kind of fits. Find your way to a better marriage. All about this. Sorry, reading an interesting story. It's by a, a gentleman who does uh, Christian marital counseling. And he wrote a story talking about uh, how sometimes when he's doing counseling with couples that are in trouble, he makes them keep a little bit of a diary. And he gave us a sample. Why don't you read? I want to read this. This is from a couple, a husband and wife. They both wrote this on the same day. Here's the wife's entry in this diary. Tonight I thought my husband was acting weird. We had made plans to meet at a nice restaurant for dinner. I was shopping with my friends all day long, so I thought he was upset at the fact I was running a little bit late. But he made no comment on it. Conversation was not flowing. So I suggested we go somewhere quiet so we could talk. He agreed, but he didn't say much. I asked him what was wrong. He said nothing. I asked him if it was my fault he was upset. 
He said he wasn't upset. It had nothing to do with me. Not worry about it. On the way home, I told him that I loved him. He smiled slightly. Kept driving. Can't explain his behavior. I don't know why he didn't say I love you too. When we got home. I felt as if I had lost him completely. As if he wanted nothing to do with me anymore. He sat there quietly and just watched TV. He continued to seem so distant and so absent. Finally, with silence all around us, I decided to go to bed. About 15 minutes later, he came to bed. But I felt he was so distracted, his thoughts were somewhere else. I fell asleep. I cried. I don't know what to do. I'm almost sure that his thoughts are with some other woman. My life is a disaster. Here's his entry from the same day. Boat wouldn't start, can't figure out why. Boat wouldn't start, can't figure out why. That sounded about right. I like that one. Two people who did not even realize the damage they were causing to their relationship because both were self-absorbed. Both were self-absorbed. He didn't communicate and she assumed way too much. And assumed, by the way, that he knew what she was thinking. Sometimes I found in conversations, you know, men, men are lousy at communication. Okay, so men take the brunt of this, but women sometimes can assume men, can, men think the way that they do and know what they're thinking. And that is just not true. We think completely different than They approach things thinking they understood the situation. You know what, really, when it comes down to it, the husband is thinking he's protecting his wife, and the wife is reading way too much into this, and both fail because they are approaching things from a human perspective. I read earlier all of Psalm 51. It is worth reading over and over again, and it is written by King David. I want to contrast David with those Pharisees I mentioned a few minutes ago. Because, like David, they saw themselves as leaders and as deeply religious. David is confronted by sin, and he reacts in a very different manner. If you look at it, if you look at the biblical accounts, David was probably, from a human point of view, the worst sinner between him and the Pharisees. I mean, he was a murderer, adulterer. He did everything wrong. And yet, later in the Bible, we find David described as a man after God's own heart. What is the difference? Because sin is not just about the things that I do that are wrong. The things that I do are the symptom. The problem is my heart. Sin occurs because something is deeply marred within us that keeps us from being the people that God created us to be. We need to learn to focus on the Savior, not on sin. To move past mistakes, to forgive ourselves, and then completely focus on the one who brings hope. That psalm, it says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. My sin's there. I can't get rid of it. It's always in front of me. And it's in contrast 
with the God who is just and the God of love and the God who is right. A few verses later. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Our only hope is what David came to realize, and that is the very presence of God in my life continually, all the time. Next few, few verses later. Deliver me from, my, from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. He recognizes the full extent of his need for repentance, not just sinning, but turning from sin to God. And instead of reliving the sin and, and continuing to feel guilty about that which is forgiven, David turns to worship. He starts to revel in the full glory of forgiveness. And he keeps his focus on what God has done. You know, confession is not just something we do at the moment of salvation. It is an ongoing thing. Not for the sake of holding us to our guilt, but to release us from guilt and to unleash the Holy Spirit in our lives. There's an old Scottish preacher by the name of George MacDonald who said, our sins are crimes that hunt us, either to the heart of God or to the pit of hell. And so the Bible makes a big deal out of confession. Listen to this out of Psalm 32. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. The devastating effect of failure to acknowledge and confess is put up here, and contrasted with what happens when we open our very hearts honestly to God. But it gets harder. It's hard enough to confess to God. Listen to these out of James 5. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Ooh, that's a lot harder. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. That's that whole come together and seek godly counsel. And spend time praying for each other as people have failed. The topic of last week was forgiveness, and I want to finish our sermon series coming back to that. All of us fear that our pasts or our failures will define us. The mistakes will be the thing that people see first when they see our faces. And the problem is how much we think others just see our failures is directly related to my ability to embrace the forgiveness of God and the forgiveness of others. We said last week that forgetting is not the same as amnesia in the Bible. I heard a great line this week that forgetting sin really is more about not letting the past change the present. We said last week that it's not about keeping a record of wrongs, not letting it affect our present relationships. I might keep a record of wrongs. I might even keep a record of my own wrongs. There is certainly one who does keep a record of wrongs. Do you know what his name is? Satan. The Bible calls him the accuser. 
He loves to keep records of wrongs. We need to move past sin. Not just sin that others cause against us, but the same topic that we're talking about today. When I mess up, I need to accept the fact that I am forgiven and fully embrace that forgiveness within my very life. I need to move past sin to allow forgiveness to wash over myself, to let it overwhelm me, to let the love of Christ be who I am. Talked about those Pharisees. That was the last time Jesus confronted the Pharisees. Later on, in fact, just days before the crucifixion, he starts calling names like snakes and whitewashed sepulchers. And he talks about how they try really hard to look good in everybody's eyes. It says in the Bible that they were to give one tip of all that they had to the work of God. We sometimes grow thyme plants in our garden. They're great fresh. Really hard to work with because they're such little leaves. You ever grow thyme? They would go along to those thyme plants and cut every tenth leaf off. Take it to the temple and give it there to show this is the extreme that I'm willing to go to show that I am right in the eyes of the law. And then Jesus comes along and says, yeah, but you've forgotten love, justice, and forgiveness. All of us need to learn it's not about being right, it is letting go our need to be right. In humility, destroying pride and saying, I'm not worried about appearances, I admit I make mistakes. I admit I sin, I admit I struggle, and I admit that I'm not getting better. But that's not who I am. I am the child of the Almighty God. Forgiven. And set free. Full of hope. <coughs> abounding in love. That is why unforgiveness is so dangerous. Because it means there are limits to love, limits to hope, limits to mercy. God wants us to understand that there is something better possible. We come this week to Good Friday, the reminder that there are no limits to God's forgiveness. And then after that to Easter and the reminder that there are no limits to life. The only limits that we have are the ones that we impose. And as we come to the end of this series, we say that we forget sin from ourselves and others. And instead we remember the great cross of forgiveness. That we glory in that, and that is where our focus is, not on our own sins, not on the sins of others. We don't remember that, but we do remember what Jesus has done, lest we forget the great events of Jesus' forgiveness. And we're going to sing about that to finish. I'm going to invite our worship team to